very simple. I would like everyone in the library to think that they are capable of and play a role in innovation. I would like to sustain a culture of innovation in the library and increasingly I would like to harness the ideas, creativity and efforts of our community in developing solutions or improvements. The National Library was the proud winner of the 2011 Excellence in E-Government Award for its work on Trove and I want to use Trove as my case study very briefly and perhaps I could ask you if you know of Trove, if you've used Trove. You can put your hand up, I'd love to see your hand up. That's great, thank you. Trove is a national discovery service. It provides access to nearly 300 million resources created by or of interest to Australians. It has a special focus on Australian documentary heritage and offers many opportunities for the public to engage with and contribute to Trove content. So, for example, we have hundreds of thousands of images of Australian life contributed to the service via the Flickr pool. Users have added 1.5 million tags and nearly 40,000 comments to resources that they find in Trove. They've created 21,000 lists of resources across every possible subject area. And in most cases, they've chosen to make those lists available um, and accessible to all others. Amazingly, our users have corrected more than 62 million lines of digitised newspaper text, turning the often less than perfect text generated by computers from newspaper images into coherent text. Two individuals have corrected over one million lines of newspaper text each, and they vie with each other to stay on top. So tags, comments, lists and text correction all improve the trove corpus, making it that much easier for others to discover documentary heritage resources they may need. And that's work we could never do in the National Library. So the National Library embraces the open data imperative. Almost all trove data and records can now be accessed via our Australian, our application programming interface. And the only exceptions are those where specific licensing conditions prevent us from making resources available. What has made this public engagement accessible, possible, and why has it been embraced so enthusiastically? First of all, I should say that Trove builds on the library's decades of experience in working across the country and across all collecting sectors. And it depends on the commitment of cultural institutions to making it easy for Australians to find and access their documentary heritage. So a strong collaborative ethos and base. We'd dreamed of these kinds of user engagement options long before technology made it possible. Web 2.0 and social media options have allowed us to fulfil our dreams of being engaging with a very wide public from all across the country. We have a very skilled IT shop that works closely with our business areas and in our IT area we encourage our colleagues to play and to be creative. IT staff stay with us because they can work on interesting projects and during our big innovation thrusts, which come along every few years, really push the boundaries. While the library community is built on the notions of continuity, we were also prepared and able to let go, to trust the user community, to recognise the value and the knowledge that the public can contribute to institutional collections. And to have a go, that sense of experimentation, and to release our collective national documentary heritage into the wild. Innovation comes in cycles or waves in institutions, we can't innovate at the same level, in the same space, all the time. For the next few years, the library's resources will be concentrated on managing our huge digital collection, which is essential if we're to continue delivering large amounts of content to the public. An innovative culture can be a vulnerable one, and I'm mindful of Seth Godwin's three curses of criticism that put the brakes on innovation. He says that when successful companies or organisations fear external criticism, when successful innovators are more subject to harsh criticism, 
and when less innovative people have carte blanche to criticise the, un the innovators unfairly, then innovation is cursed. And so, if we are all to nurture innovative thinking, I recommend Seth Godin's three rules of constructive criticism. Criticise an idea based on how well it's going to meet its objectives. Fairly compare the idea to the status quo, warts and all. And if you don't like an idea, it's your job to come up with something better by Friday, because no solution is not a solution. Thank you. There's a bit of good old Australianism in there. Have a go. Why not? Thank you, Anne-Marie. Very encouraging. Ken, could I invite you now in terms of uh, perhaps a, a department that's got innovation as part of its title and uh, whatever else that you might have as your personal thoughts? Well, thanks very much, Anne, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. What I wanted to uh, talk about um, briefly is um, the, what the government is doing um, uh, to set the framework conditions for stimulating greater innovative activity. Um, and um, I'd like to start with a big number, and that's 500 billion. The public sector represents about 34% of GDP in Australia, and that's around $500 billion. So not only does the public sector represent a, a major chunk of the economy, but, are, but it also provides um, a, a network of policies and services that underpin society and, and activity in the, in the wider economy. And in government, we often talk a lot about business innovation, and we certainly in our department talk a lot about business innovation to lift productivity and generate new wealth and jobs. Um, but just as the econo economy needs um, an innovative business sector to be successful, we also need a well-run, responsive and innovative public service. And um, creative and effective policy development and program delivery and services which meet the needs of citizens and are delivered efficient efficiently are really keys to, the, to a successful economy and society. So the government did a major review of the innovation system back in 2008 and um, it identified that while the, the Australian public sector wasn't bad in terms of a, a forward-looking stance on things, there was much greater capacity for innovation than was being realised. And in response to that, the government um, committed to public sector innovation through the Powering Ideas uh, statement and it sought further work uh, to be done on how to encourage and facilitate innovation across the public sector. Now, as members of the public service, not a day goes by when we're not reminded of the considerable challenges that we face and uh, things like increasing government and citizen expectations of the quality and relevance of programs and services, uh, growing policy complexity, and we've seen that uh, just recently, for example, through the challenge in terms of getting carbon reductions down, the need to embrace new tools and uh, to source ideas and to communicate in different ways and to reduce regulatory and, and compliance burdens on, on business and society, and also, of course, something that's very much in our face at the moment, the, the ongoing need for fiscal restraint. So these are all challenges that uh, we need to bring an in innovative uh, approach to. Um, but, you know, the government has really delivered a, a massive agenda uh, um, for um, Australia over the last few years. Big policy changes have been made, complex programs have been uh, introduced and, and significant reforms to service uh, delivery have been made. And a lot of that's involved uh, a, a very different and innovative approach to issues. But I think um, while we can come up with some excellent individual examples of innovation in the public sector, I think as leaders we need to try and systematise innovation uh, in the public sector so that sort of it becomes ingrained in our culture and the way we do things around here. And this will be essential if we are going to continue to address this, the challenges uh, that we face. Um, to, so to achieve this innovation at a more uh, systematic level, we need an ongoing uh, focus on the framework conditions for innovation in the public sector and actions to facilitate uh, innovation across the public sector. 
we need a more open and collaborative approach to public policy and administration, and a lot of that won't come easily, I suspect, uh, to some areas. We need a more strategic approach to incorporating innovation into our businesses, to recognise that innovation is at the heart of good public administration, and to systematically seek to incorporate it into our planning and approaches. And we need to apply the right skill sets to the issues we're trying to address including through facilitating stronger citizen engagement and engaging more effectively with academia. And we need to share and recognise innovative achievements. At present, we're not good at recording and sharing our learnings across the, uh, the public, public sector agencies. We're doing some things in that space, but we need to do more. And we need to celebrate success and reward public sector innovation. So with strong and consistent leadership, I think uh, these measures uh, will support over time the development of a, of a more innovative public sector culture. And I think we've taken some good steps. So we've released the, um, the Innovation Action Plan. I guess most people have had a, a, an opportunity to look at that. Um, that was endorsed by all, all um, departmental secretaries, drew signatures prom prominently in the uh, in the, on the document, and it's an excellent statement, I think, of intent and provides the framework and the mandate uh, for the APS to embed innovation in its work. The plan acknowledges that harnessing the innovative potential of the APS and the wider citizenry is critical to success, and it sets out some principles and a structure to achieve this. Another thing that we've made some good progress on, and you'll hear a little bit more about very shortly, is to establish a centre for excellence in public sector design. The centre will bring design thinking and co-creation to the task of developing solutions to complex policy and service delivery problems, and we'll shortly be announcing uh, the uh, chief executive of, uh, of that centre. Another thing we've done a lot of work on is um, to put in place mecha mechanisms to measure progress. I'm a strong believer in what, what gets measured gets done, and it's always good if you can put a bit of competitive tension in the system between secretaries on how well their agencies are performing on the innovation front. So we need, so we need to know how we're uh, going to uh, identify weak spots, uh, our strengths, and to incentivise better performance. And so with the APSC, uh, uh, the Innovation Department is working on a range of public sector innovation indicators to allow us to do, uh, to do that measurement. So the Australian Public Sector Innovation Indicators Project, it aims to develop and implement a way of measuring and reporting on innovative capacity and performance in the APS. The project is intended when completed to generate outputs at both a departmental level and a whole of public service uh, level. And it's going to measure aspects of innovation in the APS, such as the type of innovation that's being undertaken, the levels of investment in, in innovation, innovation strategies, and also the impact of procurement on innovation. And the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, uh, Dr Ian Watt, has, rec has recently written to all departments asking them to complete a pilot survey in July, August of 2012. The Secretary's Board will also, uh, will also be uh, uh, getting a regular or an annual report, that, which we will put together in the department, on how things are going in relation to the implementation of the Innovation Action Plan. And this is going to be important, I think, in terms of retaining visibility of progress and ensuring that there is ongoing commitment. GovJam also uh, is uh, a fantastic example, I think, of some of the things that are being done to stimulate innovative activity across the government. I think it's a very exciting development and the department uh, has taken a lead role in that. So I think these new approaches re reflect our commitment as leaders to transforming the APS into a more nimble and responsive, capable and connected organisation. Um, but the challenges we face will require new ways of working and close working relationships between the public sector and other sectors, private and academic. The public sector does not ha have all the answers and our future resides in collaborations and partnering to, partnering to achieve these results. And I think some exciting things are happening uh, on that front in terms of the way we're communicating with our constitu constituencies and citizens and uh, sourcing ideas and incorporating that in our policy development and program delivery processes. Thank you. Thank you. 
Fantastic. So again, Ken's given you a very uh, succinct overview of not only the framework, the principles, structures, uh, other uh, important tools, the indicators, etc. Um, but I think that final message about the public sector not operating in isolation um, and our future is around partnering with others to be able to bring all that forward. So changing the culture and in an open and collaborative way. Uh, Drew, could I invite you to speak about and uh, share your ideas on innovation from your perspective? Thank you, Anne. Uh, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, uh, which is data. I want to talk about data. Now, I don't mean the famous Android from Star Trek Next Generation. I'm happy to talk about that data. I'm talking about the, the numbers. So we all uh, hear these uh, rubrics like evidence-based policy or good policy is underpinned, uh, good data underpins good policy. Uh, the, the conversation that I most often have in my head in policy debates is when somebody's coming in and, and uh, presents their case and I'm thinking, well, thank you for your self-interested and unsubstantiated assertions beautifully presented <laughs> on a PowerPoint, but now show me the real numbers, now show me the evidence, now show me the data. Uh, so to me, uh, a great part of innovation in the public sector is drilling back down and building and finding the data sets on which good policy can be made. Uh, I want to talk about two examples uh, in that area, uh, in spatial data and energy data. But they have two things in common. Uh, one is that, that the core, the source data that is often needed to underpin good policy uh, is often held in multiple uh, departments, multiple governments, multiple businesses. It's disparate and, and not coordinated. And there are often gaps in it. It's, it's uh, rare that you start this sort of exercise with perfect data. So my two examples. Uh, firstly, spatial. Uh, and I know you had a presentation from my colleague Helen Owens this morning about her work. I want to talk about spatial data at a national level. Uh, I chair the Australian New Zealand Land Information Council, which is the body that, that oversights the Commonwealth State Territory, the COAG, if you like, structures to coordinate spatial uh, activities across the nine Australian governments and our New Zealand colleagues. Our analysis says that when you strip it down, there's about 10 fundamental spatial data sets uh, which underpin uh, all sorts of locational geocoding activities. If these 10 fundamental data sets, data sets were ubiquitous and accessible, they would unlock and enable all sorts of spatial analyses and innovations to flow from that. Uh, they're, not, they're not hard to envisage what they are around property and address and transport and water and so on. Now those data sets to be useful need to be accurate. Uh, accuracy's got a number of dimensions, the spatial dimension, the temporal dimension and the attribute dimension. Take a road, uh, are we talking about the centre line being good to a centimetre, good to a metre, 10 metres, 100 metres? Are we talking about it being a road on a plan that a surveyor drew 100 years ago or a road that's actually on the ground and built today? Uh, accuracy has many dimensions. So we're working uh, within ANSLIC and through the company that we jointly established, the Public Sector Mapping Agencies and the Cooperative Research Centre in this area, CRC for Spatial Information on a national program to specify these 10 or so data sets, identify the gaps compared to what we want and what we have today in all of them, and to try and build them and make them accessible. That's hard work. Uh, it requires the states and territories in the Commonwealth to share and integrate and build data across political boundaries, small p political boundaries, where in many cases we're operating in fundamentally different policy regimes, let alone the physical problems of integrating disparate data. <coughs> the challenge in many ways is how to rise above lowest common denominator. It's easy to find the data set that we can all agree on and knock it out. It's the data set we should have uh, and the challenges of getting there. Another example is in energy. Uh, we're currently uh, well advanced in developing a new uh, energy white paper for the Commonwealth. Energy's a great area to work in, it's very important, it's ubiquitous, uh, and it's contentious, uh, often the contention relating to climate policy at the moment. 
but it's a good example where good policy requires good data, data around the supply, the demand and the use of energy and not just at the headline national level but taking it right down to that uh, points of production and points of use. And there are fundamental gaps in Australia's data. Uh, we have very relatively poor information about consumer end use of energy compared to many other countries. We're very strong in some areas about energy production, although that's on grid, we're not as strong off grid. Uh, again, it's an area where much of the data we need does exist, not all of it, but it exists in all sorts of disparate sources. Uh, there are some very interesting things happening in the energy market at the moment. Demand has stopped growing in the way it classically does, understanding why that is the case. Uh, there's a revolution taking place in the gas market worldwide and in Australia, and the impacts of that on energy consumption in Australia. So again, the, excess, the issue is about building collaborative structures uh, to uh, collate this data and make it accessible. The challenges around governance uh, and the whole willingness to share in this area. So in my two examples, uh, the underlying problem, the barrier to innovation, to unlocking the data, is not about budgets or creativity or technology, although all of those are helpful, um, but the fundamental barrier is, barriers are not in that area. The barriers are really around the ability to cooperate and collaborate and share. Uh, particularly in federal structures, be they literally federal, Commonwealth State Territory, or virtually federal, like within the Australian Public Service, across all of our departments and agencies. And that's hard work. Uh, you've got to overcome all sorts of cultural and political barriers that essentially require agencies and individuals to sacrifice their self-interest for a higher good. Uh, it's a very noble sort of a statement, and most people say, yes, I'm into that, but dot, 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 uh, and then the problems become, and years later, you've still got inadequate data. So having a compelling business case uh, for these sorts of programs is, of course, necessary, but it's way short of sufficient. Uh, the, the barrier, the innovation, the hard work is really around the political economy of building these data sets uh, rather than just the economics in the classical sense. So for me, when thinking about innovation and its role in policy, uh, my, my view is always go back to the data, show me the numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Um, a real challenge is there. Um, barriers around the ability to collaborate, um, cultural and political. Um, and sacrificing self-interest for the betterment of many more, uh, particularly uh, relevant for a lot of what we do across government. Our final um, panel member this afternoon, David Fricker from the National Archives of Australia. And that's an institution that really is uniquely placed to consider how success and utilisation, utilising innovation over time is best represented. So, David, could you join us, please, and share your thoughts and ideas? Thank you, Anne, and uh, thank you so much for making me go last. <laughs> I've been crossing out everything I was going to say, so thank you to my, uh, my colleague, uh, colleagues on the panel. Um, look, what I might do, though, is, is perhaps reflect on um, uh, what are the, the attributes of an innovative organisation. Uh, and so, because, you know, we do, as an agency head, I think about innovation all the time, and what am I doing to promote innovation within the organisation? You know, what, what am I doing to make sure that the best ideas float to the surface, and when those ideas come into the executive boardroom, they don't get you know, dashed against the, the, the rocky shores of despair. They, in fact, get picked up, uh, funded and carried forward. And just to sort of look at, if you like, what, uh, what the anatomy is, if, if you like, or what the culture is around uh, an innovative organisation. At, at the outset, I agree, um, uh, you know, what the Nick's comments earlier about what change is, uh, what innovation is, I should say, resonated very strongly with me, that, you know, the idea of innovation is to change the business to create some sort of value for the citizen. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's got to have a purpose and it's got to have a profound 
uh, objective. You know, it can't be tinkering with this or that. It can't be fine tuning. Uh, you know, these things are all innovative and they're very useful work. But there's maintenance and enhancement, and then there's true innovation. It's changing the business to create some value for the citizen, and that that means you've got two two responsibilities there. One, you've got to you've got to understand value, and you've got to understand the organisation you're in, and what is the value proposition of that organisation. You know what is the the thing that is most valued that you are really delivering out of that organisation. So in the case of the archives, you know, you've got a, a, a popular image of the archives, which is a big repository full of boxes of, of files, of documents. And well, that's great, and it's a beautiful image and all the rest of it. Uh, and there are people like me that really enjoy going through and, you know, fosking through that stuff. But that's, there's no value in that. You know, nobody values me for what I know. They value me for what I can tell you. You know, they value me for the knowledge that I can provide to all of you. And so that's the value proposition that I'm talking about. So the archives exists to connect you with some essential evidence about what the government has done in the past. You know, sometime between Federation and now, what has the government done? You know, did it send your grandfather to war? You know, why? You know, show me the records. I want to know, you know, what granddad did and, you know, why he went and all the rest of it. Uh, was there a cabinet decision about nuclear testing in Maryland? I want to see that, you know, give it to me. That's the value proposition of the archives. And so you look across everything we do there and we say, well, you know, now in order to do that, we need, of course, to collect this material in the first place. We need to preserve it. We need to organise it. We need to arrange it. We need to set it up in systems, et cetera, and provide services. But we don't do that for, it, for the sake of preserving stuff. We do everything we do for the sake of making it accessible at the end. And when you, when you start with that sort of notion, you start this... You know, we, we often think left to right, you know, through services. How can we provide this service in a better way? And we sort of start at the beginning and, you know, we work our way down to the end. If, with this value-based uh, approach to it, you, you think right to left. You know, you, you think about the outcome and you think what's the shortest possible path to providing that value at the end. And in the case of the archives, the easiest way to do that would be to get the information in a digital form in the first place. Uh, and so it doesn't have to pass through any hands. If it comes into us in a, in a digital format, well, then we can immediately, with technology, make it accessible to everybody, you know, within uh, the constraints of, you know, classified information and sensitive information and uh, through the, you know, um, uh, constraints of, of law, of course. But, but that's the sort of thing that is most important to me, that it's all about the value proposition. Know what value you're adding. So don't reinvent services that nobody wants. Think about new, profound changes to the business. Now, if you're going to do that, you also, of course, have to know your customers. So not only do you have to know your value, you have to know who you're dealing with. What are they capable of? You know, what are their expectations of you? Uh, are you only thinking about one sector of the stakeholders, or are you also considering, considering government, you know, the, the regulators? Are you considering all of the other constituents that need to be satisfied by the actions and the values that your organisation provides? If you know that, uh, then you've got a much better chance of getting an idea up and getting it approved and getting it moved ahead, and you've got a much better idea of having it uh, rewarded and, and appreciated by all people uh, that enjoy it down the track. Um, so to achieve that then, if, if, you, if we commence with that as a sort of the basis of, of uh, fostering, fermenting innovative thinking, then you need to create a culture, an innovative, a culture of innovation uh, within the organisation. Uh, and that means that you need an organisation that's got an appetite for innovation. You know, it has to be something which is talked about a lot with you, with your team members, with, you know, up and down the line. You need to have this appetite for innovation. It needs to be valued. Uh, also, you need, and this has been discussed as well already, you need a high level of resilience. In fact, I think I'm plagiarising quite a bit from you, Mick, but uh, resilience is so important. You know, Mick talked about, you know, if you take this approach, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to stumble, you know, you're going to hit obstacles. And so you've got to prepare the way for that and have a high level of resilience in the organisation and this sort of culture of fault tolerant. You know, we're learning from this. We're pushing that out. I mean, Anne-Marie talked about the Trove um, uh, facility. It's, I don't know what to call it because it's so big, Trove, the concept. And it's, it's magnificent. You know, it, it is just uh, such a great innovation for connecting people with knowledge that they would otherwise not have. And it didn't, you know, I'm sure there were mistakes along the way, and I'm sure it was sort of took a lot of um, risk taking and a lot of problem solving along the way, but a great deal of resilience and sticking to the plan and making it happen. So that's the, the culture. I think the other thing is around innovation, in my experience anyway, uh, you need teams uh, clustered around these ideas 
which are small, uh, they're nimble, uh, they're, they're passionate about what they're doing. Um, they've got to be a high level of extrovert uh, members in those teams as well. I mean, you need a blend, but you're going to need some extroverts in there uh, because it's got to be a very chatty, communicative, it's got to be a loud team. Small, nimble, but loud. Um, and so if you've got that, that sort of um, uh, disposition to communicating and talking about what's going on and this passionate exuberance about what is being done, uh, then you are going to uh, intuitively, you'll be connecting with all of the partners and all of the stakeholders that you should be connecting with uh, and keeping people moving along with the idea. Because we're not talking about change management today, we're talking about innovation, but there's a huge uh, attention that must be paid to change management and making sure that uh, these major innovations are not just dumped on an organisation that was quite comfortable with the way it used to be working. So there has to be that sort of um, culture and that sort of energy in that small, nimble, resilient, extrovert uh, team. Um, on that though, it has to involve everybody. So there's a small team driving this, this innovation, uh, but it has to be a culture of involvement. Uh, and also we've, you know, the, we've heard about you know, the need for collaboration, we need the, uh, for partnerships and forging partnerships across the organisation with other organisations, with the private sector, with industry and with the community. So very important you know, to make sure that that is picked up along the way. Innovation works best when you're exercising influence over a, a network, when you're exploiting uh, a network to actually make that innovation uh, take, take hold. The other thing that uh, it irritates me about um, innovation when it becomes a proposal and when it comes up to, to an executive board meeting or it comes up for funding, somehow along the way it turns into an IT project. And I, and I hate that, <laughs> all right? Good. I'm, I'm pleased to hear you <laughs> laughing at that. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not a bloody IT project. Okay, thank you. Very good. <laughs> good. Um, um, and you know, often, and it, and it breeds this sort of counterculture that you know innovation comes in a shrink-wrapped box. In okay, well, you know, look, I've said enough. You, you obviously get it. I'm not going to dwell on it. But it is, you know, because you know, once once it becomes an IT project, well, then it becomes, you know, it's owned by the IT guys. And I love IT. I'm an IT guy. I love them all dearly. But it then disappears and it, it appears later on as something that was too expensive and nobody really wants it anymore because we've all moved on. So don't do that. Um, and look, what I'll, I'll finish on as well is that it, it's got to be uh, based around a shared vision and that vision has to be sustainable. You know, what, whatever chops and changes it, it makes along the way, it has to glue on that you know, value proposition ideal, it has to be glued to a shared a uh, sustainable vision about what value we're adding and who we're delivering that value to and it's got to survive all of the speed bumps and the twists and turns and the evolutions along the way. Uh, and it's just important for that shared vision to either be built into or start from the corporate plan of the organisation. So if, you, if you're fishing around for innovative ideas, the first port of call ought to be your corporate plan and it ought to be your strategic priorities and you've got to find a home in those strategic priorities and say, aha, you know, this innovative idea is going to deliver on that strategic priority, take it upstairs and it'll get the funding, it'll get the support and it'll get the, uh, the sustained backing of the organisation. So thank you very much. So we give him the hard gig, the last of the crew, and uh, he tops it with it's not an IT project. Well done. Uh, but it is also very much around innovation over a network, people and other, uh, and the necessity of having that strong interconnectedness so it takes hold. Okay, the floor is now open for you to ask questions of any of our panel members. I just uh, invite you to put your hand up. There will be a mic that will be made available for you. Indicate who you are and who you'd like to direct your questions to. Uh, be brave. Here's your opportunity. Uh, over to you. Anybody like to kick off? There's one down here, thank you. So we're going to take all the time we were allotted, so think of a question or two for you. Hi, a question for David, if I may, just picking up on your point about small, exuberant, nimble, loud teams, which I think is, is really great. 
Um, and picking up on the experience from the UK government about their skunk works kind of approach, the challenge, of course, is to take it from those small, nimble, loud teams and then flow it into the rest of the organisation. How have you found that experience in, inside your organisation, how you take that energy and then make it work more broadly across all aspects of the business? Um, I uh, should be on. Hold it close. Yep, Of a good idea. Oh, here we go. Um, look, it is important, and this is why I need that extrovert team and that exuberance, and also why I need it pegged, like absolutely, unmistakably anchored to the corporate plan and the strategic priority that we've had. Because if you've got a corporate plan and you've got strategic priorities, then a lot of that grand work has already been done. You've already sifted out what would other, what would be a good idea whose time has not come from the good idea whose time is is here right now. Um, and and look, what I would do, and, and what works for me, is to get your senior management excited about it. I mean, innovation uh, in this sort of innovative culture you know, has to come from the top uh, down. It, it has to exist as a culture, which again has been picked up by, by the other speakers. It has to be part of the culture of an organisation. Uh, and I think that that excitement and that exuberance and the passion is infectious. And if it is, again, everybody, you know, my performance agreement is how much of that strategic plan I can achieve. And if you can, if you can pitch that to me, well, then you've got my full attention. And then everybody that works with me will also have my full attention because that's the result that I want. You know, we also heard about um, having the right metrics in place, you know, how to, how to measure progress and make it happen. Uh, you know, we have to have a culture of celebrating success as well. Uh, achieving success early is another important part of innovation. And so I think if you can, if you can really make it bloody, you know, absolutely bleeding obvious that this is part of our strategic direction, our plan, there is a result soon. This is not a five-year, you know, IT project. As I said, it's not a it's not a long wait. It's within this budget cycle would be ideal. Uh, that's the way you maintain momentum and the way you maintain uh, some excitement for it. But if you you know if you engage a senior executive, uh, well then you know it's going to it will get legs and, and make it cheap and then you'll. <laughs> Another question from the floor. Thank you. No, 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 no. It's recording, so if we could just. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kim Amos, and I actually am a social media strategist, and I consult the government. But I guess it's really a comment back to what you've said up there on the panel. And I guess the thing is that we're in the middle of a series of cultural, economic and digital changes. And I think sometimes it's not a question of whether you should innovate and the risks associated with that, but also the risks if you don't. And you have to weigh those up as well and present case studies on those. OK, so uh, not only important to um, license doing innovation but make sure that we can get examples of that out to show others uh, just what has occurred and how that they could perhaps look at that might be suitable or something like that in their own organisations and I think that's very much part of the framework work that uh, innovation has led but all of us can do that. Another question, we've got a couple more, about four so we'll do Gentlemen, lady, lady and gentlemen. And another one, okay. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Philip Thomas from the Idea to Action Centre at uh, UNE. And I've got a question for Drew. I'm, I'm all for data as being a measurement of uh, your success here, but I'd put it to you that perhaps there are two data sets there. And one is the uh, changes, the institutional changes, some measurement of the institutional changes that have to take place in order for you to achieve the spatial and energy data that you're requiring. And I'd just like your comment on that. I, I don't believe that it's, um, that, that re, I don't think you can restructure your way to uh, the solution. Uh, the idea that, that there can be a central body that does it, if that's the premise of your question. I've uh, 
I've, I've moved on the, from the idea that we could do that we could fix these problems through machinery of government or structural change. I think you have to collaborate. Uh, in our system, of course, the structure of government will change so regularly that you've actually got to create underlying, enduring cooperative arrangements that survive those changes uh, to, to ensure that these data sets that I'm talking about continue to exist. But having said that, I think there is a leadership function that has to be found. You can't all sit around the table and, and be peers and equals and find it. Somebody actually has to step up and take a leadership role. Thank you. The Next. Young lady behind. Hi, um, my name's Ingrid. I'm from the Department of Human Services. Um, I'm interested in getting your perspective on um, how we can make sure that um, good ideas don't get lost in a department of 36,000 staff um, where there are hundreds of executive. Okay, panel, your thoughts. Don't look at Go for it. Don't look at me. They've got more executives than I've got staff. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll pass that to Ken. <laughs> pass the baton. <laughs> I think the question, the comment over there was that there's a sort of inevitability about this. And, and I'm a little bit more radical, I think, on this subject that about not asking for permission. And I, and I think even within the public service, I think we have a duty to innovate without being given permission necessarily. And I think the vehicle for that innovation in an environment that maybe is not as you know, a, akin to, to innovation as some of, of the ones we've talked about is, is to simply do it. Okay, so um, don't ask for permission, I think, is the summary in that one. Um, my, yes, it may be forgiveness and uh, just uh, uh, very careful steps, perhaps, in some of that. Uh, we had somebody else with their hand up for a question. One, one there and one here, and I think we're probably close to time then. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Alf. I'm also from Human Services. Um, Drew was talking about the challenge of um, unifying the parameters of data sets and then the fact that they were in a bunch of disparate places and at the moment um, with the government trend towards transparency of data and, and we're kind of using uh, Facebook and other available channels where they're really commodifying data and I'm just wondering with the, the CIO, of, um, CIO here if there's like a need or a pathway to a platform where you know unified data sets might be when the, the geospatial challenge is resolved. And, uh, that, and whether that could also be a mechanism for engagement and public use. True. <laughs> um, well, that is part of the work that we do across our CIO cohort and understanding what, as you t talk about, um, what unified data set and how we would best be able to use that across our service delivery and our other activities. Um, but I think we need to again, uh, focus on what are the specific needs that we're trying to address through that, um, because we could work on that for a very long time without an exact outcome. So it's just balancing the need versus what is opportunistic at times, um, and prioritisation, being informed back in from our CIOs in leading their business needs or supporting their business needs from their agencies. A question down here. Uh, Chris Sampson from Future Earth Systems. Um, we've heard today from many different speakers that um, true innovation requires risk and a culture that allows experimentation and, and failure. Perhaps the panel would like to comment on how their organisations are set up um, for this culture. Okay, panel members. Drew thinks I should start. Um, <laughs> I think that the first and most important cultural lesson is that uh, blame gets us absolutely nowhere. Uh, I would rather know why we think it didn't work and how we do it differently next time uh, because every, every experiment and possibly every failure is the step on the right direction uh, for something else. Uh, that's what I would stress most strongly. Um, and, and you asked about how the organisation is set up. 
uh, to do that. And, and of course, I agree absolutely with, with Anne Marie's comments. But organisationally, within your policy framework, you can have a reward and recognition policy which zeroes in on, on those things, which does actually pull up the achievements of people uh, in terms of, you know, good risk taking. Because there is, I mean, there's bad risk taking as well. You know, risk management is not just, you know, on a frolic, you know, uh, irresponsible. But within your reward and recognition policy framework, uh, you really can be uh, uh, recognising those sorts of achievements and rewarding that, which then fosters more of that, uh, that sort of behaviour across the organisation. Thanks. Thanks for that. I agree with both of those comments. One thing um, that um, has driven, I think, our focus on establishing an APS design centre is, is a sort of a recognition that with significant innovations there is quite a lot of risk around some of these things and you do need room to fail and failure is okay. And I think we've probably got a long way to go in the public sector, actually, in terms of, of getting acceptance of that and a culture that accepts that readily. But um, certainly um, one of the things we're trying to do through the design centre is, 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 is to sort of get, get that acceptance. And that'll be working on some significant uh, projects that have relevance across government and reporting back to the Secretary's Board and that sort of thing. So maybe that can be part of that cultural change. I, I think that it, it certainly needs to go upstairs to the political process as well. I think for a, a politician to say, we're going to take some calculated risks, we are going to experiment and it might not work, um, is a very difficult thing for a modern politician to say. Uh, but I think it's very, very important to change the understanding of the community that that's what it takes to innovate. Great. Well, panel members, thank you very much. Um, one more final question. Then. One more final one question. Final question. Um, we've just considering that we just had GovHack over the weekend, and we saw a number of young innovators who were sort of either in university or we even had uh, some coders in from Grammar. Um, we were wondering about how government can establish itself so that it's appealing to these people, so that they want to come and work to go work in government instead of going to work in the commercial sector. And how can we provide the sort of flexible frameworks which these students are going to be expecting when they get to the age where we're going to be looking to employ them? So just a little plug from my organisation and what we do in trying to have our early entrants come into government, be they cadets partway through their education and training, through early uh, apprenticeship processes and what we say to them, you can come into government and you can have an experience across such a diverse array that you would not get in any one other single institution outside of government. You could work on flash stuff through the work in um, Drew's environment around data and spatial data and, and data enabling. You could be part of uh, exploiting the technologies that Anne-Marie and her colleagues have. You could be part of work that it is around new service offers, etc. But my panel members might also have other comments that they'd like to offer. No? They're quiet. Um, we would encourage all to look to government to be a, a, a core leader in that part. I was just saying, and I just can make a quick, quick comment um, about the GovHack. Um, you know, I'm a real supporter of the whole GovHack movement and the innovation. Um, and I've been trying uh, in our own jurisdiction to promote many, many, many data sets to become available. And hopefully we'll, we're going to achieve that. On The GovHack really showed me in very stark terms why that is a very, very good idea. And, uh, and to your point, though, about how do you integrate the two, um, you know, what I've got to tell you is that the winner of the ACT award um, I've already told the centenary people <laughs> about that and they were delighted and the connections will be made. Uh, there were two or three other bottle of ideas that came out of that uh, that again need to make communication over the next few weeks. Now what comes out of that is maybe an understanding of the people in the GovHack about what motivates government and how government works and vice versa an idea from the government people about this sort of creativity and innovation that's out there. Uh, Eventually, it's, it's about contact and communication. Okay, well, could I ask you to join with me in thanking 
Mick and Marie, Ken, Drew and David for their panel session this afternoon. Thank you.